Now, intelligent design does no better when it talks about blood clotting. Um, I'm sure you all know that blood can clot, and many of you who have had the misfortune to take biochemistry as a college course also know that there is a complicated pathway of proteins that is responsible for blood clotting. Dr. Behe argues, and intelligent design argues, that pathway is irreducibly complex. And again, what does he mean? None of these proteins do anything except clot. In the absence of any of them, blood does not clot and the system fails. So the argument is the reason we know a creator had to create it or design it is because all the parts have to be present together. And the reason we know that is in the absence of any of the components, blood doesn't clot and the system fails. Only when all the components are present does the system function properly, even though, uh, and us nasty evolutionary biologists point out, that all of these proteins, are almost all of them are serine proteases, which means they were probably formed by successive rounds of gene duplication. But once again, they say all the proteins, no, nothing, unequ nothing equivocal here, all the proteins have to be present simultaneously for the clotting system to function. That's very interesting. Being an empirical scientist, I always want to say, is that right? Well, how could we test it? We could test it by taking this wonderfully complicated system and let's take a component away. Let's knock one out and see if they're right. Well, the first one that we can knock out, because nature's done the experiment for us, is factor 12. Um, what happens if we knock out factor 12? Another PowerPoint experiment, there it goes. Factor 12 is gone. Will blood still clot? Well, not in us, but it turns out that whales and dolphins lack factor 12. It's actually an evolutionary adaptation to deep sea diving, and their blood clots just fine. That means that proposition that they all have to be present is wrong. Now, taking one away, that's kind of chintzy. Take, take a few more than one away. OK, fair enough. Um, how about we take three of these factors away? Well, it turns out the puffer fish, a genome that was sequenced just a couple years ago, is missing the entire three-part contact phase system up there. The puffer fish has blood that clots just fine. So this argument about unevolvability, which is based basically on the argument that all the parts have to be present, it just turns out to be wrong. One of the arguments that evolutionists like Kim Miller use in defense of evolution and against irreducible complexity is the argument that the blood clotting system can work fine even if numerous parts were missing. According to this argument, the fact the blood clotting system can work just fine without necessarily having all the parts together is a big blow to the irreducible complexity argument because it demonstrates a more simple evolutionary pathway. Evolutionists like Kim Miller will argue that the removal of certain parts and still being functional is evidence against intelligent design. Unfortunately, contrary to Kim Miller's claim that the removal of certain parts will still cause the blood clotting system to be entirely functional, the peer review literature demonstrates a different story. A literature review reveals that the removal of such parts in the complexity of the blood clotting system, whether by random mutations or intentional site directed mutagens, has resulted into devastating and even lethal effects to living organisms. Contrary to Miller's claim that the blood clotting system does not require other parts together, reality demonstrates quite the contrary. One paper in the peer-reviewed science literature is a paper titled Targeted Mutagenesis of Zebrafish Antithrombrin 3. In this paper, researchers have collected samples of zebrafish and intentionally disrupted the protein-coding antithrombrin 3 or simply AT3 gene sequence under what is known as site-directed mutagens. The researchers were interested to see what effects would occur if one were to disturb the AT3 gene that played an important role in blood clotting. After the knockout of AT3 gene, the zebrafish were reported to be completely healthy on during their embryonic and larval stages. However, upon them during the stage of adulthood, they began to suffer greatly. It turns out that the disturbance of the antithrombin 3 gene has led to a cardiovascular disease known as thrombrosis. Because of the presence of thrombrosis, due to the removal of the AT3 gene, the zebrafish starting in their adult stage began to suffer greatly and eventually died since their blood clotting system did not behave properly as it was supposed to. Not only does the paper report that the removal of AT3 gene results in cardiovascular disease, but also as well in the deficiencies of other blood clotting regulatory proteins, such as protein C and even protein S. What this paper demonstrates is rather not in favor of Kim Miller's argument since it goes against his claim 
that the removal of certain parts in the block clouding system will not result into the overall system being corrupted. Another paper similar to the previous zebrafish study is a 1996 paper titled Loss of Fibrinogen Rescues Mice. Here in this report, researchers suggest, just like in the previous paper, more health diseases due to deficiency problems within the blood clotting system. In cases where mice lack plasminogen, they suffer thrombosis, high mortality rates, and even ulcers. By contrast, in cases where the mice have the plasminogen but lack fibrinogen, they suffer of blood loss due to ruptured blood vessel, unable to clot and heal properly, and in females, even death upon pregnancy. In this paper, researchers use uh, samples of mice and see what effects will occur if one were to knock out both the plasmid and fibrinogen gene. To their discovery, they reported that the removal of both genes actually results into better health conditions than that of mice suffering only with plasmid deficiency. Nevertheless, regardless of the improvement of the mice health, they still suffer diseases that are phenotypically non-different from those mice that only lack fibrin. What these two papers demonstrate rather is that the intentional or unintentional removal of parts from the block cutting system can make its overall function go out of commission, causing numerous and even deadly diseases. The fact that living organisms cannot live or at least remain healthy without having any of the parts removed imposes a significant dilemma against the theory of evolution since it shows that those parts must have existed spontaneously if the system was to function properly. This isn't a surprise really considering how even vitamin K deficiency can result into easy bruising, more bleeding, and even cause an impairment of blood clot. This is clear evidence that all of these parts must coexist at the same time since the lack of one could result into blood clotting system to crash. Now here's a catch. Even if we assume that evolution had the ability to create all the parts necessary for the blood clotting system, would that definitely disprove a reducible complexity? Not quite. Contrary to what many evolutionists may think, Having all the parts together as a complex whole actually still won't be enough to resolve the reduce, irreducible complexity dilemma. For one, the blood clotting system requires a regulatory system where each protein that contributes to the overall system must be strictly regulated and timed properly. Consider, for example, that a living organism begins to bleed. What must be done besides all the parts in the blood clotting system? Well, let's consider that one, the blood clotting system must know where exactly to target the injury site Failure to do so will still cause bleeding since it failed to block the bleeding site. Two, it must know, especially for thrombin, just how much exactly should fibrin be produced to sufficiently seal the bleeding site. Failure to acknowledge how much fibrin there should be could lead to difficulty in blood passage and eventually into heart disease such as thrombosis, heart attack, or stroke due to fibrin blocking the pathways where blood flows and most importantly, three, must know to regulate and hit the right positioning and timing. Otherwise, bye-bye evolution, go back to square one all over again. Well, there you have it folks, the blood clotting, a reducible complexity argument as an argument for intelligent design still stands and still imposes a significant challenge for evolution since one, it needs to demonstrate the origin of regulatory mechanisms, two, show how it can evolve without messing up the blood clotting system, and three, where did all those proteins evolve in the blood clotting come from? Alright, well that's the end of for this presentation, so thanks for watching.